So welcome to another session of the Arctic Summer College. And uh, my name is Max Grunig from the Ecologic Institute in Washington, DC. I welcome you to today's session. We are today on the global or world Indigenous Peoples Day. It's a, a nice coincidence that that falls onto the day when we have the Arctic Summer College session. So I have to say up front, first thing, we have today only one presenter. Our second presenter, uh, Alexei Tsikarev, has contacted me uh, hour ago that they have a severe power outage in his home region and he won't be able to reach us today and uh, there is also no way for him to call in over a phone line and either way he couldn't make the presentation so we will uh, re uh, schedule his in, in his uh, presentation for one of the next uh, Wednesdays and I will notify you of course about any uh, updates on that matter and uh, that means one today we have a little bit more time for our other presenter Stefan Schott and uh, two we might possibly close a little bit earlier today depending on the con uh, how the conversation evolves, of course. But either way, we have up to two hours, and it's great to have here with us today Stefan Schart, a professor at the School of Public Policy and Administration at Carleton University. Um, professor Schott has a PhD in Natural Resource and Environmental Economics uh, from the University of Gulf. And he's been um, the graduate supervisor for the school at, uh, at, at uh, Carlton University. So in that regard, also uh, it helped us find some of the participants for this year. So thank you very much for that. And has been uh, teaching at and with the Arctic Summer College and supporting us through that uh, over the last few years. And so thank you very much for being here today with us and presenting on food security and sustainable fisheries in the Arctic. And uh, yeah, if you want to explain more about your background, uh, feel free to do so. I just kept it quite short and will uh, yield you the floor now and we'll come back later for the Q&A for the discussion to everybody participating. So you can ask questions during the presentation, especially if they're understanding questions, feel free to ask them and we can stop in between and answer these understanding questions. And of course, uh, the real conversation, the real discussion will then be after the presentation. So thank you. And Stefan, uh, yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. thanks for inviting me again uh, to the Summer College. Uh, uh, I just yeah, just to give you a bit more background too. I'm actually uh, have done research now for over ten years in the Arctic, and it's becoming a bit of a focus of my research, uh, especially in the Canadian Arctic. Uh, I'm branching out now f for some international comparative work as well, um, but that has been a focus uh, for me. And um, uh, I um, this this talk today is about uh, a very important topic for northern communities, uh, which is food security, and also um, uh, developing uh, fisheries in the Arctic, which is uh, a big topic uh, because of um, uh, international uh, agreements of not going ahead with uh, uh, with uh, with. Uh, uh, offshore fisheries and open seas, uh, but we uh, see some uh, inshore and nearshore development, some commercial fisheries uh, offshore uh, of Baffin Island, but we also, uh, what we're grappling with this in this project is how do we develop uh, more inshore fishery and create economic development possibilities for these communities that mostly depend on uh, mining activities, uh, some tourism, but uh, the renewable resources offering uh, an alternative to non-renewable uh, exploration. So I'm starting here with um, 
uh, a picture uh, of uh, that you might wonder why I put this on here. Uh, but this is actually from last uh, summer, so about a year ago, a field trip uh, into um, for Joe Haven, Nunavut, and from there towards the Canadian mainland, Chantry Inlet. I'll show you later on the map where exactly that is. And uh, what you see here is really um, uh, this kind of uh, challenge of how to balance um, uh, living off the land as uh, most indigenous um, people have done over the last uh, hundreds or thousands of years and, and uh, but also dealing with the modern wage economy and buying uh, food from the store that is often very expensive and unaffordable so uh, we we went on a trip with with uh, as two families uh, research assistant and a consultant of mine uh, for four or five days camping and hunting and um, this kind of the food that was p purchased by the families until we got some meat off the land and you can see here the variety of food uh, that presented um, uh, some arctic char there, some uh, stews that have some uh, fish in them uh, we hadn't uh, succeeded hunting any meat yet and then a, a bunch of other food that is um, not necessarily um, maybe the most nutritious so um, again, also I want to uh, emphasize how important it is to get nutritious food from the land, from the ocean, uh, to supplement other food items from the store that are often processed and um, uh, fresh fruit and, uh, and meat is often uh, not uh, very available and extremely expensive. Although in Canada we do have Nutrition North, a program that subsidizes uh, some of the more nutritious food items. So I'm going to move on here. I just want to acknowledge also funding support for this project. Um, uh, we have now secured two projects that's, uh, that are trying to look at that. Uh, one is actually a Genome Canada large-scale applied research project, uh, Feeding the Future, which uh, is uh, a very large grant, uh, which also involves uh, colleagues at Queen's University, um, uh, Virginia Walker, Stephen Lockheed, uh, and Peter de Groot, um, who are doing the biological and uh, uh, genomics uh, research on this and uh, our work, um, my research assistant, uh, one of them is probably online here and is a participant in the um, summer college uh, which is Emily Hewitt, you might you probably met her before in your discussions. Um, we are uh, looking at the social science side and uh, the traditional knowledge side uh, of um, the research project. Um, and also recently we secured um, some polar knowledge uh, funding on food security and sustainable fishery development uh, where we look at a two-year harvest study to document seasonal and spatial variation in hunting and fishing, fishing around Joe Haven, Nunavut, which is a bit of a pilot of a new approach of understanding the economics of harvesting and uh, the policy implications of that. Sorry. Yeah, so here, this is uh, our project uh, towards a sustainable fishery for Nunavut. I wanted to acknowledge that uh, this was created as a logo for our project by Danny Aluk uh, from the community, uh, which you know portrays the uh, important fish Arctic char for all communities, the traditional drum dancing in the area, the Inukchuk for as a symbol for Nunavut because this is uh, towards a looking at ideas for developing sustainable fisheries for Nunavut and also the owl which is a symbol for uh, Joe Haven. Um, so first to, to give you some context, more context, um, a, a recent study has shown that 70 percent of households in Nunavut experience food insecurity. This is 10 times higher than the national average. Um, which means uh, people either don't have sufficient food or uh, not uh, the uh, right type of food that is um, that is desirable and culturally important. Uh, also, access to food uh, and affordability is an issue. Also, the region that we are working in, the Katikmit region, which is the Western High Arctic, has one of the highest unemployment rates uh, in Nunavut. There are not a lot of uh, economic development options. Um, we are we are uh, developing them together with the community and the Hamlet office. Um, but it, uh, it is a high unemployment rate while there is a big population growth in the community. So a big challenge. Commercial fisheries are a strongly growing and promising sector in Nunavut for economic development. Uh, and also as you um, have heard before, I'm sure, 
and the opening up of sea ice gives us increased access to fish stocks with potential um, offshore uh, trawling, with potential foreign fleets coming into the Northwest Passage, um, which is, uh, is, as you know, also probably um, uh, considered an international shipping route, but Canada does not acknowledge that. Canada uh, um, treats it as inshore uh, uh, waters uh, that have been traditionally used by uh, indigenous groups in Canada and uh, does not, uh, uh, there's a sovereignty uh, discussion on, on the Northwest Passage. Northwest Passage is becoming a viable shipping route. We see increasing traffic with um, um, cruise ships, ships, uh, transportation ships, also uh, uh, yachts and personal vessels. There's not enough known about Arctic fish stocks and migration behavior. Our own Department of Fishery in the Ocean is um, uh, doing some work there, but they cannot uh, be in all the regions in the Arctic and the North to consistently assess stocks. And so we are increasingly relying on capacity building and um, training and input from local communities in assessing uh, fish stocks and migration behavior. Uh, uh, and so mm -hmm. Additional context, sorry, I just have to click this. As I mentioned, this was a luxury liner that made its way through the Northwest Passage last uh, year for the first time. Any, luxury, uh, any cruise ships of that magnitude uh, had never gone through there. Uh, this is the Crystal Serenity that had an uh, icebreaker in front of it and two helicopters following it, and it made a trip from uh, Anchorage to New York in record uh, speed. Um, uh, but this is something that we will uh, see increasingly in the future. And uh, for uh, here's also an idea of the unemployment rate in the area. If you look towards the right, Joe Haven there has 34%. Um, and the neighboring communities, Kugluktuk, Taloyuak, uh, Kugaruk, uh, also have in the range of 28 to 31%. And um, the national average at that time was uh, in 2016 was 6.9 percent. So we'll see a big challenge here. Only the big, really administrative um, communities like Cambridge Bay and Iqaluit are really uh, having a slightly lower, uh, more acceptable unemployment rates. But the rest of the uh, communities really uh, need some uh, viable input in uh, future scenarios. Also, because we see that increasing traffic and because we don't know a lot about fish stocks, uh, we need a baseline of population status and value of northern fishery resources. So we need to understand better fish stock spawning areas, movements, and uh, we require a better understanding of the local economy, its contribution to food security and access to hunting and fishing. So what we don't know a lot about is cost and returns of subsistence harvesting, how are labor markets and income levels linked to providing country food in the community, how, can, how affordable is it to go out hunting and fishing, and how is this uh, cost changing? How far do people need to travel, etc.? So those are big questions that haven't really been addressed. Now, to put this a bit more also in, uh, into the context of land claims agreements and indigenous rights, uh, Nunavut is our uh, most uh, recent territory that was uh, created, uh, started in 1999. And uh, as part of that process of creating uh, this new territory, there have been a lot of um, rights uh, and processes that have been put in place on wildlife management, for example. Uh, and um, uh, here you see a relatively sophisticated co-management approach uh, that uh, is binding for uh, the governments. Uh, and you can see in, at the bottom there, uh, the hunter and trapper organizations have quite an input, uh, as well as a regional wildlife organization, and then also governments, you know, the government of Nunavut, Nunavut GN, Department of Fisheries and Ocean, Canada Wildlife Service, uh, and the general public as well. They make recommendations together on, um, on management quotas, on uh, you know, uh, harvest uh, rights, on, uh, on uh, putting certain certain animals under observation or not. Uh, and then um, they, these recommendations are considered by the Nunavut Wildlife Management Board. They make a decision and the government either accepts or rejects. And then it goes back to the Wildlife Management Board for an alternative proposal. And uh, eventually, if the government accepts, 
then the government decision uh, is challenged or not. If it's challenged, it goes to uh, it goes to judicial review, uh, and then there's a direction by a federal court to to the minister who uh, that implements management actions. We see some of this happening with polar bears, where there are quite a lot of challenges. Um, recently, we also have seen a lot of discussion on caribou management and uh, and putting uh, certain areas under uh, quota management that weren't under that before because caribou in the area that we are working on does not have any restrictions on harvesting at the moment. So uh, what are the objectives of our research collaboration? Um, we want to uh, map genetically fish species of importance. Uh, here especially we're looking at Arctic char, whitefish, cisco. Initially we also wanted to look at uh, shrimp and cod. Uh, we did some initial analysis on that. It wasn't as uh, promising and successful as we hoped and therefore we are now focusing more on uh, more traditional uh, food sources that can be used, bo consumed both by the community and for subsistence harvesting but also can be uh, sold to other markets uh, uh, within uh, Nunavut and outside of Nunavut and outside of Canada. Especially Arctic char is quite desired uh, in many um, restaurants and markets as well as frozen product uh, everywhere in North America and Europe. Uh, we want to strengthen food security. Um, we uh, want to create a baseline for the region explore sustainable commercial fishery opportunities. We also want to screen for contaminants in the food to see uh, how different fish species by location differ perhaps in contaminants, how clean the products are. There's some concern about that uh, to, um, for consumption pr um, purposes, etc. And we want to uh, compare that also with other regions of Nunavut where this work has been done on contaminants. At the end, we want to explore bottom-up co-management impl implementation. Uh, as I mentioned here, uh, going back to my di to the diagram of the Nunavut land claim agreement, on paper there's a lot of uh, power for uh, local hunter and trapper organizations, but um, the capacity is not quite there of how to gather that information and how to communicate it to uh, other decision-making bodies um, and to uh, uh, generate data that uh, is uh, un understandable and uh, can uh, feed into management decisions. Um, we want to build local capacity in fishery research and monitoring through training. We are working very closely there with Arctic College as well as uh, the government of Nunavut that is uh, that are doing some programs like uh, coastal aquatic monitoring programs called NCAMP. We've just uh, ran one of those um, uh, programs in the community of Joe Haven uh, that involved uh, uh, local uh, harvesters um, and they were trained in actually taking their own samples from different uh, lakes um, to process the samples uh, so that they are ready for scientific analysis uh, and uh, they are now kind of certified in doing this as, and can officially submit these samples to the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, which will then pay uh, for them so that the Department of Fisheries and Oceans can have more uh, data and information about the diversity of different water bodies in the Arctic. Well, that's a step in the right direction, and we are trying to build more capacity in all types of fishery research, uh, fishery management, and uh, data management. Uh, and then finally, also, a big topic is uh, how do we more effectively co-produce knowledge and apply it in management decisions and policies? With a lot of traditional knowledge uh, that uh, we started with in our project uh, to listen to um, the knowledge holders, uh, what they knew about fish stock, what they, uh, what they wanted, uh, um, where they wanted to go with their resources, how important uh, they are for certain uh, subsistence and cultural activities, what are certain rules in the community that need to be obeyed uh, to, and uh, what do we do, how do we uh, uh, now communicate what we gather with our knowledge um, production and how we combine it to uh, a, a, an effective use. That's, uh, that's a big uh, discussion that many scientists are also grappling with because they, they, they collect a lot of information that then is not being used or it's not being properly communicated to uh, back to communities and um, 
use uh, users of the resource and knowledge holders. So it's a, it's a big topic in Canada at least, but also internationally. Um, as there were many sessions at the recent International Congress of Arctic Social Scientists in EMEA on that uh, topic that was in uh, June. So here is part a, a diagram of our a general diagram of our research process. As I mentioned, we, we start with traditional ecological knowledge consultation and uh, workshops. Um, and we give research updates uh, and try to produce uh, co-produce knowledge. From that, we formulate research plans and, and sampling strategies, really fishing sampling strategies. Uh, then we propose the research and fishing plans to the community, the fishing advisory group, and the local hunter trapper association. From that, we constantly revise research and fishing plans, incorporate feedback. We sample uh, and create capacity and use training through the sampling process. And then we do some analysis, genomic analysis and other data, and then we feed it back to the, um, to the um, community and knowledge holders through uh, feedback workshops. And then we continue the process. Uh, this is going on. Our project is for four years. It started in 2015 and will go till the end of 2019. Uh, and it might be extended for another year after that. Um, so, um, what are the social science research components in this? Um, Genome Canada uh, is giving out uh, funding to major projects uh, like this, but they always require some social science components, some uh, um, people that can uh, involve people that can translate the findings into something uh, that gives back to the community or that creates new pro products that are um, useful after the fact, so Genome wants to see that the investment pays off, basically. So our uh, involvement with my research team, and I uh, have uh, three research assistants uh, uh, that work on this. Uh, Emily Yu is one of them, Jacqueline Chapman is working with me, uh, Mark Contanero and Sophia Royal, we're all working on this uh, with me. Um, first, uh, we, we deal with the traditional knowledge consultation and interpretation. Then uh, we work closely with our Carleton University's Geomatics and Cartography Center, uh, who has uh, um, pioneered um, some new um, software to map knowledge and co-produce knowledge. And uh, so we use this as an interactive online atlas that I will show you later on, and hopefully it will work the link uh, from this presentation. Um, that we uh, document our data spatially and also sh uh, present it back to the community so that they can see what they have shown us on maps and what they have told us is represented online interactively and accessible by them. Of course, we went through rigorous ethics with that. We consulted with the community if they would, what they would like to share in public and what not. Uh, and that's a very important part of this process. Uh, food security and the economics of harvesting is a big contribution of our research team. Uh, we, are, we just started a harvest study that I will talk a bit more about that actually gets into the economics and also about um, spatial and season, seasonal variations of harvesting, uh, which also can then uh, be used to see uh, how maybe some uh, climate change impacts uh, have changed locations, have changed uh, the safety of travel to certain locations and how that uh, connects to uh, item one of traditional knowledge of where to go, when to go, at what time of the year. Um, fourthly, we, we are looking at viable business models and co-management strategies within the co-management um, legal framework of Nunavut, but also uh, what are other viable uh, business ideas for uh, local inshore fisheries that deal with both uh, commercial and subsistence harvesting. Uh, and um, uh, what have other communities done uh, in Nunavut and uh, internationally, and how can we um, uh, create a successful business model uh, with the community if they want to advance the commercial fishery? That's up to them. Obviously, we'll discuss that once all our data is gathered. We're already starting this discussion with the Hunter Trapper Association and the Hamlet of Joe Haven. And finally, as I mentioned, capacity building on our end as well. Uh, the harvest study actually uh, will create uh, two positions uh, that uh, we directly pay for for two years. One's, one is the local facilitator for the harvest study. Another one is um, we are actually starting a youth apprenticeship system 
um, to um, understand what is involved in doing um, a harvest study and assessing um, the economics of harvesting and basic needs of the community. Um, so, um, to uh, look at the process that we were involved in, um, we started uh, last year in 2016 in February it was a whole week uh, traditional and local knowledge workshop where we invited around 22 elders and active harvesters from Joe Haven. We invited two harvesters from the neighboring community of Cambridge Bay and one harvester from Cougar Rook. Uh, there was also Monica and Gohia Tok, uh, fishery sector specialists uh, from Kogluktuk who came in, three interpreters and research partners, three interviewers and other team members. So it was quite an undertaking and very important to have interpreters um, so that the uh, uh, that we can hear all the elders who predominantly only speak in Noctituk in the area and also uh, even if people are bilingual they feel more comfortable in sharing the information uh, in their native language all uh, obviously and um, also we identified through that of course some um, traditional names for certain species uh, that uh, are hard to distinguish by uh, scientific names so uh, which actually could help our management plans um, and I will talk more about the results in a second. Um, here is a, a good picture of our workshop uh, that we had. Uh, we had to clean up the elder center that hadn't been used for two years. Uh, it was a very nice um, surrounding there. People felt very comfortable. We started uh, in the morning and February was about minus 50 degrees and the furnace wasn't working. Uh, luckily, there was one harvester who was a furnace specialist who could fix it. So we had a bit of a rough start, but then it, uh, we had some uh, very good discussion. And there was an in, in, uh, incredible buy-in from the community and interest in looking at commercial fisheries and also sharing the knowledge and uh, learning more throughout uh, through our project. Here's some of the agenda that we uh, did. Uh, we had some community consultation an overview of the project, timelines, research methods, local involvement and feedback. Very important to do this early on so that um, we are not making some mistakes in certain, for example, research methods that are unacceptable. And an example is, um, uh, for example, catch and release is a big taboo there. Uh, some of us might think it's good if we catch something and we put it back in the water. Uh, these uh, fish are deemed to be contaminated and not uh, will not be consumed and uh, it's something that uh, is absolutely not um, appropriate. Uh, also tagging, there was, um, so there was uh, a lot of um, disapprovement of tagging methods uh, that have been used in other areas, so we, we stayed away from that. Uh, most of the fish that we catch for sampling, uh, we will um, take out s s uh, what we need and then share the food f with the community. We then had focus group discussions on harvest selection and behavior, fishing locations and observations, harvest practices and sharing rules. As uh, many of you will know, sharing is a big uh, traditional uh, practice uh, in uh, most indigenous communities. And it's very important to uh, share food with elders, people in need, with relatives, with uh, other social network partners. Uh, and we also want to document changing conditions. Then we did some group ecological mapping, some uh, group uh, mapping on commercial potential areas. And we had discussions on experience with commercial fishing activities in the past, lessons learned. Uh, we were quite surprised to see that there have been made several attempts of commercial fishing and all different types of uh, ownership structures and uh, with different uh, uh, equipment and markets for, for the products and uh, we, uh, got, uh, found, we discussed some of the lessons learned and what uh, needs to be done differently uh, once a new commercial project fishery will be started. And then we did with 25 harvesters individual land use mapping that we then um, digitized and in, uh, put it into our atlas tool that, so that we could show uh, individuals uh, maps and also uh, overlay them to see where people go and where the best spots are for sampling, for example. 
here you see some group mapping exercises here with an interpreter and then we also did some individual land use mapping this is in the uh, hunter trapper organization office uh, where we talked uh, with, with interpreters and uh, indi uh, individual harvesters on where they go to harvest not only fish but also other food items since we're interested in food security uh, and since m most people are not just going out fishing or hunting everything happens together we need to know where people go to uh, uh, to gather all their food items or you know, the most important food items these are kind of the uh, maps that were created uh, and with different colors. Uh, we've learned some lessons from that, uh, what, to, what to do better. Here you see also the area, uh, King William Island um, is um, an island there in the Northwest Passage. Uh, Joe Haven is on the uh, southeast coast there where uh, it's a community of around 1400 people. And if you go south, straight south from there, you will see the uh, Chantry Inlet and the Canadian mainland. That's where most of the elders that um, live uh, in Joe Haven originally came from, it, where this is kind of the last nomadic generation of elders that used to be nomadic on the Canadian mainland uh, and know, therefore know that area very well in terms of uh, food and uh, hazards and uh, the the land itself, the landscape, and many of the of these elders would like to go back there in the summer to camp and uh, fish and hunt, and that's also where they would like to see more commercial fishery development. Um, so, uh, what types of fish did we uh, did we identify? Uh, oh, from the group ecological mapping, we, we identified three types of cod, uh, two of which were consumed, two types of shrimp, small and large shrimp. We uh, discovered it's not uh, part of the traditional uh, diet. They're not consumed. There's not an, a lot known about them, mostly from stomach contents in uh, seals. Uh, and um, the only way shrimp are consumed are actually in kind of a, a seafood haggis, if you like, uh, where the uh, shrimp stomach is uh, cooked with, uh, sorry, the, the seal stomach is cooked with shrimp in it uh, to give it a bit more taste. Uh, and uh, But otherwise, a shrimp is not a big part of the uh, traditional diet. We had identified five types of white fish, which was uh, very interesting and also uh, surprising for the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. So we, had, we did some additional work in a whitefish identification workshop in May this year. Um, we had we found different morphs, uh, reports of different morphs or types of Arctic char, but only one name for the species, and also a lake trout Arctic char hybrid. They seem to uh, be uh, mixing together. Uh, lake trout in this area actually goes into the ocean uh, because there is a lot of, uh, there's a very low salinity in the estuary where all the fresh water comes from the Canadian mainland into Chantry Inlet. The important insights we got from this is, uh, again, I talked about several attempts for commercial fisheries were made that failed for various reasons, uh, partially ownership structure, especially when the hunter-trapper organization owns um, the commercial fishery entity and uh, the hunter trapper organization has an election every year for new management structure and uh, since it changes so often a uh, new management might have different ideas changes the business model too frequently uh, and so that, that seemed to be part of the failure this um, inconsistency in uh, in people in charge Unreliable weather, marketing inexperience, lack of subsidies. Most fisheries uh, actually that um, are successfully operating in the Arctic are subsidized by the government, like the one uh, processing plant in Cambridge Bay, which is uh, a community further west uh, in the same uh, region. Um, that uh, plant employs around 28 people, which is uh, an economic um, benefit in itself because uh, people that are employed don't need to be on social assistance or um, other transfer payments uh, and so uh, it is worthwhile uh, putting some subsidies into these fishing plants it also employs lots of inuit uh, harvesters on the land that bring in the fish so uh, those are uh, different types of models that maybe that we uh, consider as a viable fishery in the south we also found that 
as, as I showed you, the island itself, King William Island, that stocks on King William Island should not be considered for commercial fishery, but only as a local uh, food basket or subsistence food source. Uh, that was surprising for us because there's already a commercial quota in the north part of the island, Port Perry, which is not uh, supposed to be uh, used uh, for um, commercial fishery. So that was interesting for us and also means that uh, it, it uh, informed our sampling strategy. The Back River Chantry Inlet could be a year-round fishery. White fish after freeze-up in October, November to March, char in September, October when they run back, when they uh, run, come back from the ocean feeding into the rivers. They come back in large schools and are easily um, caught then if you catch the, the run. Lake trout could be, uh, could be harvested year-round, but probably more as a recreational uh, fishery. There used to be a recreational fishing lot uh, on the Canadian main mainland close to Joe Haven uh, and uh, that attracted mostly uh, lake trout trophy fishing because the lake trout are exceptionally large there. Uh, we, are not looking at, um, we are not looking at recreational fisheries in our uh, project but this might be a follow-up project because we already gathered some, some uh, information on uh, preferences for recreational fishing in the area. Here uh, we, we see, I, I talked about Port Perry in the, uh, in the north there, uh, which has a commercial quota, a small commercial quota of around 1,000 kilograms for Arctic char, but uh, the community does not think it, it should be developed into a commercial fishery. Um, Murchison River on the east there used to be, it still has a commercial quota and used to be a commercial fishery. Uh, in the 90s um, and also um, Backhouse Point, legendary river there in the south side have some quotas um, uh, attached. And here are some of the uh, fishing sites, sampling sites that we explored for our sampling strategy to based on traditional knowledge that informed us. On the uh, top right you also see a bit uh, where the area is in terms of the Arctic region. Um, we did some field work so last September. We, we sampled in, in Chantry Inlet and the Back River to try to inter, uh, intercept uh, the, the runs and catch the runs of Arctic char and also some whitefish. With Inuit guides and research col collaborators, we, we have uh, people from the HTO, uh, Hunter Trapper Organization, that are actually uh, research partners with us. They're actively involved. Uh, they are always out on our, uh, sampling with us. And, and collecting the data. <clears throat> we processed uh, for genetic and microbial analysis in the field and we also piloted our harvest study with harvesters and families on the land where I was uh, directly involved in uh, uh, for uh, a week or so on the land. And then the, the issues came up. How do you define food security? Uh, what are the issues? Uh, especially uh, food security uh, differs uh, from one locale to another. So we try to f uh, get a better understanding of food security in the local context of the Joe Haven community. Uh, and we, we um, had a four-prone approach basically. We did a food security workshop in May that identified seasonal food availability concerns, concerns about access to country food, affordability of store-bought food, and also we asked people to uh, uh, rank their preferred food items and preference weights. Uh, and uh, I can tell you that for the food preferences, uh, they were mostly traditional foods, but we did in that food security workshop, we had uh, an, mostly elders and um, um, older harvesters. We will do the same workshop also with, we're planning to do this in, in August, September with youth to see the differences. But the preferred food items of the elders are still all uh, country food items, especially different types of fish, uh, caribou, muskox, uh, muktak, which is uh, uh, whale meat. Uh, those were still the top items. Uh, uh, what uh, for food and uh, for food items uh, from the store, sorry, store-bought items, and the ones that were most desirable were uh, cookies, flowers, things that are actually not subsidized by our Nutrition North program, which was interesting. 
we did a hunter registration survey for our harvest study where we asked them about uh, their costs of going out on the land for uh, keeping their equipment intact, the fuel costs, the uh, uh, foregone labor costs. Uh, and we asked for frequency of hunting and fishing by time of year, distribution of country food, how is that country food distributed in the community, how is it shared, and also barriers to going out on the land. And uh, then we are now uh, doing a two-year harvest study uh, that will provide more data and evidence of actual distances traveled, cost of harvesting, and the distribution of country food to households in need. I'll talk a little bit more about this in a few minutes. We also further validated the impact and benefits of commercial fishery and subsistence fishery development with the hamlets and the HG of Joe Haven, elders and youth in the community, where we uh, asked them again, like where, uh, how would this impact food security? Would it help food security or would there be uh, some uh, concerns that it would take away from local food sources? Uh, and um, there was a, was a wide spread, um, uh, the widespread support for commercial fisheries as long as they are not done on King William Island and as long as they are done in a sustainable manner and some of our genetic information and uh, harvest study information will of course look at the sustainability of harvesting in certain areas. All right, so here's a picture of the food security workshop with uh, Simon Okpakok, my interpreter who are, and research partner that I worked with since 2015 in the community. Many, we had a, about 10 um, older harvesters and elders, seven women, also uh, single female households that were complaining about food availability the most. And we had a three hour uh, discussion that was very insightful. And uh, some insights on food security uh, that, we, that came out of that, uh, again, I mentioned there's still a large reliance on country food and non-subsidized store-bought items. But there are also changes in the sharing culture associated with increasing cost of harvesting. There's less food shared, more sold uh, on Facebook and um, to outsiders, uh, increased vulnerability for single female household. Uh, there is a disruption in country food access, especially between January and March when it is so cold many people do not want to go out hunting. There's not enough food stored and frozen in the community. And that's also where I, um, there's a big uh, hope that uh, some subsistence or commercial fishery will actually supply more consistent uh, food and fish, uh, especially in those winter months. We also, from our registration survey, were quite surprised um, that uh, only six of 25 hunters had operational snowmobiles. The other uh, snowmobiles were not currently operational. Uh, so they were waiting for some money to fix them uh, and to maintain them or buy new ones. Um, so that was a big surprise. Uh, there is support for commercial and subsistence fishery because it will facilitate better access to fish, especially during the winter months. And the prices offered to hunters for food uh, was not, is not updated for 20 years. So what that means is uh, the Hunter Trapper Organization and also uh, food supply programs, hunter support programs are paying hunters uh, for uh, bringing in meat that is then distributed at low cost to people in need or people that want to buy that. That the uh, Hunter Trapper organization and the elders were surprised how little food was available and when I asked what they are paying the hunters it was uh, very low and hadn't been updated for 20 years. That's where our harvest study comes in too because we will uh, create an average cost of uh, hunting, uh, of harvesting meat and fish by p per pound, which will inform the authorities of how to incentivize uh, more uh, meats, uh, bring in more meat and, and that can then be distributed to people in need. There's also a lack of a community freezer, one that is consistently stocked. So those are some of the insights from the food security workshop. And now of course, um, the harvest study that we are starting now, we have registered 25 uh, uh, hunters uh, so far. We hope to register a few more, but they are a representative sample of the types of hunter in the community between occasional, frequent, uh, and uh, intense hunters. Um, so what we want to get out of this is we want to better understand how far do harvesters need to travel to acquire country food by season, time, safety, and cost aspects, 
We want to talk, uh, discuss adequate access throughout the season. What are the cost of harvesting with different equipment at different times of the year? Uh, hunters now, especially with climate change, are increasingly relying uh, on uh, ATVs uh, in the, when there's not enough snow or when the conditions are too warm or slushy for snowmobiles. Uh, so most hunters that want to go out all year need a snowmobile, an ATV, and a boat for increasing uh, ice-free uh, seasons, which is extremely difficult and expensive to maintain. Are there employment harvesting trade-offs, giving up work to go out on the land? What are uh, appropriate employment activities that can complement uh, this reliance of food from the land? And we want to keep track of changes. Changes to tradi tra traditional land use, frequency of harvest at different locations, the productivity of harvest locations, how are they changing? Uh, and the shift in harvest seasons. Is there a shift into more summer season by de depending on the equipment, etc. Um, and of course the average cost of harvesting per kilogram of food. Um, uh, also we want to know our basic needs for the community covered. If not, how could they? And this goes into the policy dimensions um, of the uh, support by the federal government, also government of Nunavut. Uh, are there conflicts between subsistence or commercial fishing locations? Do people go to certain spots that we might also think are good for commercial fishing locations? Then we need to, uh, to uh, clarify that or coordinate that by time of year. Uh, also, we want to create capacity for local self-assessment of harvest cost, distribution of food, and changes in the availability and location of food sources and species. And we also want to estimate the food replacement values if people have uh, not not, in, uh, not enough access to certain food sources and that need to be brought in from other communities or need to be bought, uh, replacements need to be bought in the store. The format is a two-year study, around 25 active harvesters. Uh, we registered them the first, uh, that was the first step. We've done that in May and the second uh, and third step will be we're going to equip each one of them when they go out with a GPS tracking device to see exactly where they're going how long they're going, at what speed they're traveling, etc. Uh, in that device, they can uh, identify uh, observations of wildlife, observations of dangerous spots and hazards, uh, places uh, that they want to document. We are facilitating that with a, with a menu that uh, gives them options of, uh, they can click on an anim animal, for example, wildlife observation caribou, and then we ask them, did you harvest it or did you see it? And they say, yes, no. Uh, and so that uh, the moment they uh, press that button, um, we know the exact GPS coordinates and it goes right, right into our database. Uh, that's something actually that I'll talk, uh, I'll show you the, the device in a second, that we are uh, developing together with the um, producer Garmin and GeoPro, uh, an in-reach uh, satellite device that uh, we are adding now different forms and software to it uh, in, in collaboration with them. And then they hand in a little trip survey after every trip where they, we will pay them for a short survey of every harvest trip that, that just uh, verifies the harvest sites and uh, what was harvested, the size of animals that were harvested, and any problems that were encountered. Here's the device that we're using this. If you have one of those, um, you will notice that on the top left corner uh, there, you will not have that uh, forms window there because we developed that together with the manufacturer and our geomatics and uh, cartography center. Mm. And here we can measure detailed time, mileage, effort data. Uh, it also creates additional security for harvesters because they can ask for help uh, with our facilitator uh, and the HTO manager. They can uh, uh, press the SOS button if they're in an emergency and need to be rescued. Uh, they can uh, communicate with uh, their families if they want uh, and uh, other harvesters. And um, here you see uh, the peers and just a snapshot of, for example, um, the um, PDF manual uh, that we are creating for the facilitator and the harvesters. If they want, we, we will train them, of course but uh, we also want them to see how this device is being used. It is quite easy because you press on wildlife and what, you say big bearded seal in this example, uh, did you harvest yes or no. So that uh, makes it easier rather than uh, 
people while they're hunting typing in uh, messages on this device. Here's also an example of what I mentioned before, the Nunavut Community Aquatic Monitoring Program that we have been involved, NCAMP, um, where you see some of the participants, not all of them are there, there were also two women participating, uh, and part of our uh, team members on the right there, um, that um, Garrett Element who has been there for uh, several years in sampling and uh, helping out uh, with, uh, with the NCAMP. Alex in the middle there who's an NCAMP facilitator uh, and does that for all the communities in Nunavut that are, uh, that are having a project and want to engage in, in, in this kind of uh, field work as well as classroom training uh, of researchers. Here, I just want to quickly show you, this is really a little bit out of my league. This is part of the genome, uh, uh, genetic analysis, uh, in this case of whitefish. And what you see here are four types of whitefish with their traditional uh, Inuktitut names, Anaktik, Kavahilik, Kakiviatuk, and Pikuktuk. Uh, and they are different types of whitefish and Cisco. And here we're comparing what our scientific analysis shows us and what, uh, what traditional knowledge has, how they di differentiate the different types of fish based, uh, we showed them pictures of the, the different samples that we took and uh, uh, it coincided their traditional knowledge, um, morphological differentiation methods actually uh, coincided with what we've found scientifically. So that um, this is interesting because uh, this is how we can uh, co-produce knowledge and integrate some of the traditional knowledge in better differentiating, uh, differentiating fish stocks and as a starting point in our analysis of uh, different genetic uh, hypotheses. So this is uh, something that is actually quite exciting uh, and we are now really using these traditional names to refer to these different types of Cisco and, uh, and whitefish. Here is a, a, a screenshot of the Atlas tool that we've created. I'm going to try to click on this right now. Um, I hope you can see this. Uh, yes, it works. Can you see that? Yeah? Yes. yes. Good. Um, so this is uh, towards a sustainable fishery for Nunavimiut Atlas. Um, here you see, I just pressed on travel, and you see all the travel routes that are taken in the area. We can uh, zoom out a bit, and you can see here how far people travel. This is reported travel from our traditional knowledge workshop. We will now also have data from uh, uh, actual travel right now by type of uh, vehicle, if you like. Uh, and um, it gives, this gives us an idea. You also, um, I'm going to get out of travel here, and now I'm just going to show you all species, how many observations we have. Um, might take a second here. It's not doing it right now. I'm going to go to just white fish for now. Okay, we're going to come back to that. So all species. might take a little longer because there's a lot of observation. Uh, but let's see whitefish. We started asking people uh, where uh, are areas where whitefish are. First, this is the furthest north we have seen whitefish, which is very interesting. Um, there are some, uh, and Cisco. Actually, it turns out um, um, when we asked for whitefish, we also got information about Cisco because Cisco is, uh, you know, that uh, people refer to the uh, traditional names and Cisco is, uh, are two of the uh, traditional types of whitefish, if you like. Uh, and this informed us first uh, where there are some areas where there are more people go and harvest and uh, also where there is good sampling opportunity. Uh, but then also we ask ourselves, okay, uh, in these different spots. Are those uh, lake whitefish? Are they broad whitefish? Are they uh, least Cisco? Are they Arctic Cisco? So uh, we went and, and asked, for example, uh, the uh, traditional names, and you can see them here, for example, now we can just differentiate and say, what, where's Anaktik? 
this is a type of Cisco. And we'll see them all, all over King William Island. Uh, we can go and ask for Piguktuk. And we see only a few spots um, on the mainland. Uh, we can go uh, look at Kakivyaktuk, and we see certain areas. And we can also look at Kavihilik, and we see here these areas. So, so now we can distinguish more the type uh, we have, and we can use this Atlas tool uh, uh, to uh, also then later on bring in our scientific findings and see how they overlay with the traditional um, uh, understanding of the different types and the locations where they are. I'll try to bring all species in here. It's taking too long, I believe. So, but we can do this for, uh, we can also go into uh, individual um, we can individual harvesters can look at, at their own map, uh, and some of them didn't want to be identified, so they are anonymous uh, or private, and some wanted to see this and show uh, their family and uh, use uh, the information. So I'll go back to the PowerPoint now, um, and I think I just want to thank uh, all the funders and supporters. Um, there's a lot of co-funding that comes along with the Genome Canada Grant, um, Fisheries and Oceans is involved with this, CANUR, Arctic College, Government of Nunavut, uh, and Environment Canada. So it's quite a, um, a, quite a lot of support from different uh, uh, foundations and uh, Canadian authorities that um, are thinking quite uh, highly about this type of research. So I will end it there and leave some time for questions. I went a little longer because we only had one speaker. But uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you have uh, about uh, the project, but also about generally food security and fishery development. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Stefan. This was extremely interesting and, and very, you know, uh, information that I think was very well suited to, to both link to what we've heard before from other speakers, but also taking it much further and going, going uh, much deeper and much more specific into the topic of both food security in general and then harvesting and fishing and hunting in particular. Very interesting, very good to see also the level of detail you're working in and also how you combine both very modern technology, but then also traditional uh, knowledge and, and the value of TK and uh, the, the, the benefits of bringing these two together, both for the, well, the, the older or the elder generation, but also looking towards the young generation, the next generation. So there have been a few questions already from participants. I also have a few questions, but I, I don't want to storm ahead, and I want to allow Bernd, uh, our, one of our participants, to ask a question. He actually has two questions, okay. and, and, uh, but Bernd, maybe ask one first and then, and then uh, wait, because they're both kind of uh, different if your microphone works. Otherwise, I can also read out the question. But when you're unmuted now, you can ask the question. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So um, early on in your presentation, you had talked about some of these different uh, contests and ways that the local communities were being engaged in this issue of uh, sustainable fisheries. And it got me to thinking about possible creative ways to apply that to the situation I've been researching. So I've been, um, for the last year, working with the Marine Conservation Institute on this. Uh, one of the Pribilof Islands in the Bering Sea had sent a proposal to NOAA to create a national marine sanctuary around their island. One of the benefits of creating a sanctuary that was discussed in their proposal was the benefit to sustaining local marine mammals, uh, wildlife, birds, and their fisheries. Um, but I've never, to my knowledge, in the year I've looked at this community, I've never heard of them doing any sort of a contest. And because the local support for the sanctuary is, I would say, moderate at best, I've been trying to think creatively about how the community could be appealed to to create 
uh, more support for the sanctuary idea or maybe something else that would be more fitting. So I'm just curious to learn more about these effective tools to engage communities around a common resource management issue. Mm -hmm. Okay. You want me to, okay, uh, I think that's a very interesting opportunity there. Um, I think uh, what happens a lot, we have that with marine protected areas as well in, in Canada, uh, that there's not enough um, consultation and input from indigenous groups and that then backfires and reduces the buy-in for this. And so, um, and also in our project, we, we often have to work on um, explaining what is in it for the community. Uh, why are we doing this and what are the potential outcomes that can help them? Um, I think um, with a marine sanctuary, it, it, it's good uh, to uh, engage obviously early on and ask uh, the community about cultural and uh, traditional use uh, and acceptable practices around uh, a sanctuary or a, a, an area and how it's traditionally being used and how it would be affected by a marine sanctuary. Uh, and um, also then I think uh, look at some opportunities for uh, indigenous involvement in um, making this work. Uh, and, and that means um, monitoring, uh, uh, conserving it, uh, uh, I, we found, for example, that um, conservation, there are not enough um, jobs around conservation in the area. Uh, people that are trained, for example, through the Arctic College Environmental Technology Program, ETP, extremely, uh, extremely successful program. Uh, people that graduate from that are leaders in the community, but there's only maybe one or two that can get a job. Uh, so I think uh, involving more uh, local assessment, especially for people that are already out there uh, and getting them out there more often through this job is I think uh, uh, an area that we definitely want to explore because the compatibility between many office jobs and uh, surviving off the land or getting food from the land is not often very good. Yeah, can I, can I just add a little bit more before we finish? Yeah. Um, yeah, and the Pribilof Island communities, they face some challenges that I think maybe are maybe not unique, but there are some pressing issues. Like the, the community in question, there's only about 100 people on the island, and the infrastructure on the island isn't exactly new, and they have an issue. One of the other related issues is the quality of their port. And, um, Sorry, the quality, of, uh, the, the quality of? Of their port, of where the ships can come in. Mm -hmm. and, there's just there's not a lot of job creation occurring there and my concern one of my concerns with the sanctuary proposal it wasn't the legitimacy of the idea it's the timeline because the school on the island was also in the process of closing and once you have enough institutional capacity to disappear from a community it, it can be hard to stop the death spiral that communities sometimes go into. so I, I've been talking to my boss and saying, you know, I think we should have a plan B here. Like the sanctuary designation process can take years, even if it goes well. So what is another option? And um, so I'd like to continue the conversation with you offline and just you right. know, tell you more about the project and, and get your input if you'd be willing to. So. Yeah, sure. That, that would be very interesting yeah. uh, because we learn a lot of lessons as we uh, move along. As I showed you, the research process is really a, uh, a, a feedback loop, um, and um, we, we, I, I think our biggest advantage is that we ha we are in the community almost every one of us in the community every three four months. So we have this ongoing relationship. We we get instantaneous feedback. We can see what uh, the preferences are, what people where people want to move with this, and um, I think that involvement is highly appreciated. Uh, it's not always easy, <laughs> and plan Bs and Cs always have to be in place, I think. Uh, that's how we have to plan in, in the North, I think, uh, generally, and we, we often don't. So, Stefan, maybe following up on that aspect, I mean, you talked a lot about uh, food use of uh, fishing and hunting, um, but one of your sponsors is also Genome Canada, so I was thinking in, in that line, are there also any potential uses or, or potential economic uses 
of uh, these um, biological resources in the sense of a bioeconomy or um, using uh, genetic information or, or um, maybe finding new species that can be maybe used in non-food applications and whether that's an issue that you look into or whether that's more next stage. We are uh, not looking into non-food applications. Uh, Genome Canada traditionally has done that more, but they're branching out into more socially uh, responsible kind of projects that look at uh, what can we do to uh, improve uh, economic conditions in communities in need or areas in need. They have increasingly invested in northern project of caribou, polar bear, fisheries. Uh, and what they really like to see is uh, job creation coming out of this and, uh, and new um, insights into fishery development. Of course, there will be a new scientific breakthroughs in genomic analysis, especially of whitefish and cisco. Um, Arctic char, uh, uh, the genome has been sequenced, uh, but we'll add to that. Uh, so there's some scientific uh, insights and maybe that actually one uh, spin-off that might come out of that is um, uh, aquaculture and perhaps even looking at hybrids between whitefish and hybrids between lake trout and arctic chart, which could be novel. Uh, and um, one of our partners is actually doing uh, that kind of aquaculture breeding work in uh, Hola in Iceland, Skuli Skulason, who is dealing with different uh, morphs of Arctic char. In his case, if I remember correctly, he, he, uh, they developed uh, different types of meat, for example, for European and North American markets. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I could have, I could go on and on, but Bernd, you also had a second question uh, regarding a very specific aspect. Uh, do you want to ask that now? Yeah, I can. So I was, yeah, I was struck by the pricing of uh, the pricing of things that uh, hunters would bring back after their activities, and I'm sure this is there's probably research and some good data out there. I'm just curious why the pricing was not updated in a timely way, and if that's a reflection of a deeper problem with the economics of food security. So. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's a good point. Uh, I think it's, it's a very, uh, we, we are in a very, in an area of, um, that's difficult to um, manage right now. Um, uh, when Nunavut was created, as part of the uh, negotiations with the federal government, they agreed to um, assessing basic needs. And um, any kind of commercial use of any wildlife resources in Nunavut, have to first uh, satisfy basic needs of people in the communities, so-called beneficiaries from the land claims agreement. And, and in order to, and only then, once that is uh, fulfilled, um, can you go into quotas or commercial activities. Now, the thing is uh, that basic needs was never really well defined. Uh, it doesn't look at the cost of food. It doesn't look at the cost of harvesting. What uh, what was done is from 1996 to 2001, they did a Nunavut wildlife harvest study for five years, and uh, where every month every household reported what they were harvesting. And they did this for five years, and that's kind of determined basic needs in terms of uh, number of animals per community. It hasn't been updated since then, uh, no economic uh, work has been done. There's a bit of a lack of capacity in training in accounting, uh, finance and economics uh, in the communities, uh, which is a problem uh, and we're trying to um, create some capacity in that. Uh, but now the government of Nunavut and also NTI, which represents you know, the rights uh, of the uh, Inuit in Nunavut, um, and the negotiates on, on their behalf with the federal government. They are now very, very interested in assessing the economics of that answer because they know they have neglected it. They look more at the science side, more at the kind of traditional knowledge assessment of a uh, number of stocks, but not so much on the actual pricing and costs and 
the choices that people make based on that. And what we see right now is, I think, a little bit of a uh, alarming trend in market creation, uh, where we are going away from the uh, sharing of the food to more individual uh, trading of the food, which can, of course, cause more stress on certain resources like caribou, for example. And it can also um, uh, leave some people out of the market. And uh, in order to fill that gap uh, for people that can't afford uh, these uh, market prices, they are supposed to uh, at least uh, get them at cost, but we don't even know what the cost is. So I think that's, that's, there's a big uh, uh, vacuum there, I mean a uh, void, uh, that uh, we need to fill. Uh, and uh, most of the work also that was done on harvest studies was done by geographers or anthropologists. So there are not, not a lot of economists doing field work. Very interesting, and that, that was also one of my interests was, uh, you mentioned the need for subsidies for fisheries to be viable in the area, and then the question is, of course, what, why is there a need for subsidies? Is this more the energy cost? Is it gear cost? Is it, wh where are these additional costs? And you said you're going to study this in the future, but it's really interesting to find out where the problems are. Yeah. Subsidies are necessary. I mean, uh, store-bought food is subsidized. Country food... So the Nutrition North in Canada mostly subsidizes store-bought food. And they decide, basically, based on nutrition, uh, what, is, uh, what gets the subsidies. So fruit or you know, certain healthy items that are deemed healthy uh, will get more subsidies. Uh, and, um, but for going out hunting, which is actually when people go out hunting, they, they acquire more nutritious food items than if they go to the store where they don't necessarily choose what uh, we try to incentivize them to, to choose. Um, and there we don't have appropriate subsidies. There are some uh, programs where you can fix your snowmobile once a while or the community go, can go out on a community hunt, uh, but it's not sufficient and it's not very well kind of uh, analyzed of what is really needed. And fuel costs are of course much higher there because everything has to be brought in by airplane or boat once a year or twice a year. Uh, and uh, also there are no repair shops. Uh, everything has to be Spare parts have to be brought in. It's expensive to fix. People have to fix their own machines. Um, boat, we had, we have a, a, our own machine that uh, can can hardly be fixed there, where we need to fly in experts to fix it. So those are kind of things that add to it. Um, and of course, also um, now the three types of equipment you need: uh, the boat, ATV, and um, snowmobile. There are no roads uh, in the area. Um, and uh, lots of breakdowns while you're on the land, which means you're losing out on um, wage costs. You need to be rescued. There are certain costs involved often with that. Um, that all adds to it. And it generally, so there are subsidies going to the north quite a bit, but I don't think we are spending them in the most uh, appropriate and the most efficient way. Very good. So, so also policy implications of your research, uh, at least in the in the longer term, um, possibly. You mentioned um, two things that caught my attention. The first thing was you mentioned the younger generation and uh, the idea of a youth apprenticeship program for uh, harvest monitoring and and sampling. So maybe you can expand a little bit on this and and what's planned and how this is going to work out in the future. Yeah, so that is already taking place. We have uh, hired a facilitator in the community for our harvest study. Uh, uh, one reason why we don't have uh, enough information about uh, harvesting behavior by season and uh, the cost of it is that uh, it is very difficult to conduct a harvest study um, with, uh, without being in the community. And if you do it for two years, it's, it's difficult for having someone live in the community for two years uh, and also someone who knows uh, the hunters well. So uh, we 
uh, are lucky to work closely with the Hunter Tra Trapper Association and it's also co-funding this harvest study uh, because they have several interests in finding out more about uh, you know availability and changes and pricing of uh, food that they buy um, that uh, we uh, first hired a facilitator that we pay an, a, a, a part-time salary um, for two years because the person is also the manager of the H uh, the HTA, the Hunter Trapper Association. Um, so we basically supplement that salary, but that person will also train a youth. We found this facilitator. Uh, together with the facilitator, we are now in the process of finding uh, a, a high school graduate uh, who can then uh, start this apprenticeship and learn how to conduct the harvest study, how to administer it, uh, what, uh, how the data will be analyzed, uh, how uh, the the uh, tracking devices work, um, what is involved with this, and how it uh, uh, how it affects um, you know basic needs assessment, um, land claim agreement fulfillment. So in the bigger picture as well, we want to train this person also on general skills that uh, are marketable for other jobs, such as you know computer skills, uh, communication skills, writing skills. Uh, and uh, we are starting this as part of this project as a part-time apprenticeship position, uh, which you know there are not a lot uh, in the community. And hopefully, we can down the road make this into a more official program together with maybe Arctic College that is as a campus in the community. We're going to talk to them about that uh, and uh, create this kind of apprenticeships uh, program um, for people that uh, from Europe. We, we we have lots of those apprenticeship programs in all kinds of sectors. They are not as widespread in, uh, in North America and Canada, uh, but they are gaining popularity and there are more and more of those um, uh, emerging. And I think uh, this uh, would be a very good opportunity also to give an incentive for high school students to finish their high school and to see that there are potential jobs that they can apply for and that they can learn more. And, uh, again, also it's very good because this job involves being out on the land, being in the office, being um, connected to uh, to being out uh, hunting and harvesting and understanding the hunting and harvesting behavior of active and older uh, hunters as well. Uh, so there's this kind of uh, transfer of knowledge and bridging the gap between the elders and youth that is also, I think, so crucial because the youth is feeling a little bit um, left out or uh, caught between two worlds. So do you, do you see a lot of, or is there, is there a positive response? Is there a demand for this, both with the, let's say, the community elders, but also the youth in the community? Yes. Uh, there's, uh, there's an interest for sure by the youth um, and uh, the elders especially. The elders feel that um, that some of their information is not transferred as much as before. They want they, they see a, uh, a growing population. So in, in Joe Haven is maybe the opposite than in your uh, case, Bernd, where the uh, community is exploding in population and uh, there's not enough opportunities for the youth, the youth is not involved enough uh, in decision making, etc. So I think the elders see that uh, they want the youth to be more involved, they want them more involved in traditional activities and understanding uh, you know, the land and the ecosystems and um, the youth is interested but a little bit, lacks a little bit of confidence I would say because of, uh, they, f they feel often that they can't step up to the, to, to, uh, to the challenge because they don't know enough about the land, they don't have uh, sufficient education compared to southerners and we want to give them back some confidence and, and that's I think a bit of a, a challenge that we're having to identify the right people and uh, to have others step up that are very that would be very good for this kind of position. This sounds like a great approach to also make it viable, economically viable, also for young people to live and and to live in the community, to stay in the community, and to also, um, you know, to to have a good life in that community with opportunity, both economically but also in social terms. It's really exciting. So. Thank you very much for this insight. I have one, one uh, 
little bit related question that also touches on uh, some of the old practices or cultural norms. And you mentioned this that when you do your sampling, you had initially encountered problems with catch and release practices or tagging. And maybe you can expand just a little bit on why that was a problem and um, in what alternative methods you can use instead. Yeah, so um, first coming back to, uh, to the uh, point on young people um, that you mentioned to stay in the community. Uh, we actually, I think, uh, there are lots of examples of young people going south to universities or to you know communities, uh, bigger communities in the south of Canada, and most of them don't feel comfortable and come back after a year and drop out of uh, college or or university. So the the success rate is actually not that good. So uh, I think there's more of a need for local education, and also for uh, southern teachers and professors to come up. Uh, to the north and teach there as uh, as well in webinars, but also being present there. Uh, yeah, and, and then coming to the sampling procedures, um, we uh, our scientists are always presenting exactly at the workshop how they are gonna catch different uh, species fish, and there's always uh, some concern or some uh, some feedback of. Uh, what hooks we are using, what nets we are using. We're using mainly gill nets um, uh, at the moment and uh, shrimp pots and crab pots. Uh, we're not tagging and following uh, fish uh, around, although I have to say that uh, it would probably be very helpful <laughs> if we could uh, assess exactly when um, when um, the schools are coming back, the fish are running back, so that we don't miss that run. And instead, we are um, uh, relying on um, observations by uh, local harvesters on boats to inform us about uh, the timing of uh, catching. And again, we also try to take as little sample as possible out of the fish and then return the fish to the, uh, to the harvesters for consumption. Uh, because as soon as we take it out of the water and you know, even look at that, we should consume it. Uh, and of course, donate it to the community. And the community is very happy about that. And uh, that's also the insight we got about recreational fisheries. The catch and release, we're not really involved in because it uh, involves more the model of uh, re and, uh, restarting a recreational fishery. Sorry? Uh, so, uh, so the recreational fishery catch and release, we asked some questions there too and got some interesting uh, ideas from the community uh, uh, of not doing catch and release, uh, but I, probably rather limiting the amount of fish that's being caught and also any excess of uh, recreational fishing to rather return to the community for food security reasons. So uh, actually, uh, so uh, sport fishers um, could uh, harvest the limit and then whatever they harvest extra, instead of uh, releasing it, just bring it back to the community and it will actually give, uh, create more buy-in for a recreational fishery. Excellent, excellent. Well, that has, you've answered all my questions that I have, at least right now. Uh, I'm sure participants will have more questions and they'll be glad if they can reach out to you after this session. Um, I would like to thank you very much for this very, very fascinating project you presented here. And I, of course, wish you all the best for the continuation of the research yeah. and, uh, and also the practical application of your research. It's a very interesting project because it's not just observing, but it's also taking action. It has direct application in the community. So it's, it's a very also very interesting in the sense that you really apply the co-creation and take it into uh, breaching also the boundary of what a traditional research project is and making this into an 
economic and into a social project as well. It's very, very exciting. And I think uh, that's a dimension that goes really far beyond the local uh, dimension of the project. Thank you so much for also extending your presentation a little bit to um, be flexible in response to our other speaker dropping out today. Um, and I would like to thank also all the participants for joining us today. And uh, I hope you have learned a lot. And I hope that we'll uh, be in touch again next week. Uh, Stefan, if you want to have any closing words, you can do that now. Um, we have no time constraint on that, so you can go on. But otherwise, I would say we, we um, have your closing remarks and then end the session for today and then hopefully have um, the uh, missing speaker from today, Alexei Tsikarev, back with us next week or one of the following weeks. Stefan. Yeah, thank you uh, for your questions. Uh, very interesting. If you have further questions, please feel free to uh, email me and uh, any insights or um, questions or recommendations are you know, very welcome because uh, it is a bit uh, of a frontier project where we really learn a lot as we go along. We don't have the answers up front. We don't, there's no specific kind of recipe of how to uh, go about this. Um, the knowledge co-production, we, 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 we learn from it, we present it to other people in the area and try to learn uh, jointly uh, because um, I think in the past it has been done too, in a too segmented manner where government or scientists uh, gather information, traditional knowledge was information and they didn't communicate well and uh, the different also um, forms of uh, uh, knowledge that were there uh, either in oral tradition, traditional stories or in uh, more quantitative data. I think we need to bridge these together to see how we can combine that to more effectively uh, manage uh, resources. And so that's what we're hoping to achieve, but we don't have the final answers. This is part of a very big, much of a learning project. So that's all I have to say. And uh, thanks everyone for listening so long to my presentation. Well, thank you, Stefan. And again, so good luck with the continuation of the project. Also, of course, uh, yeah, I hope to hear from you. Hope we be in touch. And um, yeah, thank you so much. And uh, also, thank you for uh, promoting the Arctic Summer College. And um, well, we'll be hearing from you and um, definitely also your students. So have a great rest of the day. And um, good follow on work and uh, talk to you, all the participants, I'll talk to you next week. Again, same place, same time. Thank you and goodbye. Yes, bye. Bye bye to everyone.